Power 5 fanboy again, and I'm here with Jonathan Hickman. How you doing, sir? I'm good. Excellent. Good. So we're here at Image uh, Expo, and uh, you and uh, Eric Stevenson was talking about the new books that are coming up. You've got two new series coming out, right? Yeah, we got uh, Manhattan Projects that's out uh, the first week of March, yep. and then the next month, Secrets out with uh, me and Ryan Bodenheim. Very cool. So let's start with Manhattan Projects. So is that uh, ongoing, mini? What's the format? It's an ongoing. Okay. It's me and Nick Pitar, the same guy that I did Red Wing with. Yep. Um, and it's about how if the real Manhattan Project was a cover for Stranger, more interesting projects, Manhattan Projects is the... <laughs> Bad joke. Um, <laughs> no, but uh, you know, we, we've already got orders in. They're strong, yeah. um, and you know, it's just. I think it's going to be a fun book. Yeah. So very cool. And um, you know, time frame does it take place in that same 40s. Yeah, 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 yeah no, yeah, it's yeah. it's it's Einstein yeah. and Oppenheimer yeah. and so it's real people, right? Or yeah, Jonathan destroys the reputation of real people. <laughs> is what it is. Awesome. <laughs> Once again. <laughs> So, cool. And uh, it seems like after doing Red Wing, you and Nick seem to have hit it off as a team. Or? Yeah, I love Nicky. Yeah. He's a great talent. Yeah. Um, I think he's got a really high ceiling. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, and it's and it's a good project for him, more so than Red Wing. You know, he's right. not. He's really less of a technical guy. You know, like uh, spaceships and stuff, as he is a character guy. Yeah. So this is definitely more up his alley. Yeah. Very cool. Awesome. He seems happier. Yeah. Maybe the writing's not as bad. I don't know. <laughs> I, doubt, I doubt that. So, <laughs> so and the other, uh, the other book, uh, Secret, um, you got to tell me about the cover design. Because I'm a big fan of your design work. When I saw that cover, it was not what I, I, I was a little shocked. Uh, the the yeah. tight shot on the teeth. And yeah, well, it's, it's, we're doing, it's all kind of photography based. Okay. Uh, you know, so it's, it's, um, it's a very different look. Yeah. Uh, the, the, you know, they still feel like my stuff. Yeah. Uh, but, it, it, you know, it, we're going for something really different. Here, right. um, uh, eye catching, obviously, uh, but uh, something that that really fits the mood of the book, uh, which is it's and it's a spy it's a spy story. It's like about corporate espionage and um, you know uh, not private military contractors, but security companies uh, that get wrapped up into a, a a job that's much much bigger than what they thought. Right. So, and Ryan Bodenheim is. Drawing great. Yeah. Uh, it's good to be working with Ryan again, uh, and I'm very happy with how the colors are coming out. It's kind of a monochromatic, duotone thing. It's very moody. Ooh, who's coloring it now? Uh, a guy named Michael Garland. He, he his only credit. I say this. I'm sorry, Michael, if I'm wrong. Was uh, was doing um, uh, an issue of uh, Red Mass with wow. with me and yeah. with me and Ryan. Cool. So excellent. Is that going to be? Is that an ongoing as well or mini? Yeah, yeah. I mean, right now it's it's. I mean, uh, I we're assuming that orders are going to be pretty decent for that sure. too. It's always pending sales, right? Yeah. Well, uh, you know, that's out. You know, order cut off for that is right after Manhattan Projects. Manhattan Projects is going to hit pretty good, yeah. so I, I assume we're going to be pretty solid. And, and we send out comp copies next week, right. and um, so it'll be out there in the atmosphere. Um, and I, I I feel like we're a good bet right now. Yeah. Um, I think we'll be good for stores, but uh, no, I mean, I, I, the plan is for ongoing for both of these. Yeah. Um, but definitely, Secret has the potential to have a, a you know, to to need an ending at some point. Right. You know, like the story wants an ending. Right. So. So I mean, it's interesting with your with your Marvel workload and now two ongoings at Image. Are you how are you feeling about your schedule these days? I'm feeling better than ever about yeah. my schedule. You know, I'm because I'm off of Fantastic Four at the end of the year, and I'm uh, you know down the road down that road a good bit. Yeah. Shield is wrapping up. I turned in my last issue of Ultimates last week. Mm. Um, my schedule's fine. Yeah. For the first time in a while, my schedule is is yeah. fine. So, so. I remember talking to you, and I used yeah. I, I picked up the little stress of the yeah, schedule. Yeah. 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 I, my goddamn schedule. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but it's good. It's yeah. good. So. Um, and so now you're here at the con, and you're actually doing a panel tomorrow on the importance of design in comics. Did I read that correctly? Or? Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> so well, you know what's going to happen is, unlike the panel we did today, uh, with the writers' panel, which was a clearly a comedy routine. <laughs> Uh, I'm gonna let people ask questions because you know, uh, you know. Usually, you do these things, and there's five minutes for questions at the end, and right. people don't get what they really want out of it. Um, so we'll be a little less ego-driven. <laughs> the writers were ego-driven. No. And, uh, and and hopefully help some people figure out how they want their stuff to look and how they can get there. Yeah. Because it's it's important. 
Yeah. You know? So, so if I if I brought you an up and coming kind of creator and they're looking for some advice on design, kind of what what advice do you give to those you know who are trying to figure it out, figure it out on their own? Uh, I, I would say, very generally, uh, and this is kind of what I tell everybody, color theory wise, you know, you're better off doing a white cover with black type that's going to sit on the shelf with all the other day glow kind of covers of everybody else, and uh, you know, the point there is uh, do something different. Yeah. You know, which is kind of what I've done all along. Good. So. Cool. Excellent. Well, looking forward to the new projects and appreciate your time, as always. Ho hopefully, uh, hopefully they won't be too bad. Oh, I'm sure so they're going to be good. So. <laughs> and I'm here with Curtis Weeb. How you doing? Doing good, man. How you doing? Good, good. So you're coming off very recently an iFanboy Pick of the Week with Peter Panzerfaust. I, I really appreciated that, guys. Yeah, it was really exciting, and the the coverage you guys did, people, that's where everybody heard about it, I think, yeah. because everyone up until, like, that day, where it was like, what is this about? And yeah. your coverage just brought everybody's eyes to it. So yeah, I was, laugh I was laughing. It was like it was like Peter Panzerfaust week on our site. <laughs> <laughs> so. It was. We got, some, we got a lot of coverage on your guys' site, so it was awesome. So for those who hadn't heard of the book, what is the premise? How did you come up with it? Uh, the premise is it's uh, the Peter Pan story or mythology retold in World War II. So we're taking the characters, and we're taking taking some of the like snippets of the story and reimagining them for a World War II setting. So it's about Peter and the Lost Boys getting caught up in the German invasion of France. Right. Uh, we came up with the idea, Tyler is the illustrator on it, and uh, we came up with the idea four, I three or four years ago, and it was just an email session we were having back and forth. We were talking about different projects we wanted to work on, and he, he was watching Apocalypse Now at the time, and he's like, oh, we should do something with like the Lost Boys in Vietnam. And I was like, that is dumb. That is the <laughs> stupidest thing I've heard. And then, and then I started thinking about it, like, oh, but World War II would be cool. So anyway, we, we developed it from there. It was just a brainstorming session. And uh, so it's been in development for about four years yeah. between us. So so it's got to be pretty good to see it in print and see it actually out there. Yeah, and you know, it's 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 always this thing when your new book comes out, you're always like, is anyone going to care? Is it is it going to catch on? Are people going to be excited about it? And so we were already excited about it. And uh, we, we, you know, we had seen the first issue, you know, a few months ago, and we were really excited. And then with all all the reception and people just just loving the ideas it's just been an amazing few weeks for this book so yeah it's awesome so in terms of the visual look when you're working with Tyler like the, there's a, a lot of like memorable pages like that first shot of seeing Peter and yeah. then the jump like was that all like did you give direction to Tyler or how did you guys flesh out the look of it well I mean yeah that was all those all those kind of you know one page splashes where we, we really nailed home the point those are all in the script but we, we worked together on on kind of the look of Peter I mean Tyler did all the design yeah. uh, but that page in particular, he had actually done have a mock-up of it, and it's interesting because in the first rendition he did of it, it was just a minor facial quirk, like he'd drawn it a little bit differently, and he just, he looked like kind of a jerk, like, and he just, he's like, got, he, there's a difference between kind of like this, 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 you know, this charm and the kind of carefree charm and being kind of a dick, yeah. you know, so I'm like, just, just make him a little bit more carefree, can you do that, and I, I didn't even know as an illustrator how you do that, like, yeah. oh yeah, okay, more carefree, but he did, he came back with that second drawing, and I was like, I'm like, oh, this is it. Yeah. That is the image that everyone's going to love. And it is. That's what sold the book to uh, Jim at Shadowline. And that is pretty much the page that everyone says, that's why I picked it up. Yeah. So, cool. yeah. So, uh, so what's the future of the, of the book? I know you've got a grand plan for it, right? Yeah, we've, <laughs> we've got a huge plan. I mean, the, the big part of the story, every issue opens up with an interview. Yeah. And the first five issues is what we've kind of been given at this point. But, you know, if it keeps selling as well as it is, we will get our full 30-issue run. That is the plan. Right. Um, but the, every, every five arcs, or five issues, we basically plan to have a new interview, a person that this uh, this mysterious man is interviewing, yeah. and they're going to bring their own perspective to the story and change it a little bit. You know, some people have been asking, can Peter actually fly, or is it, you know, is there supernatural elements? Well, we're going to leave that a little bit up to the reader, and, you know, they're going to see the story through the eyes of the person that experienced it. Cool, very cool. So, um, you're also into year one of uh, Green Wake, right? Last year when all the, the color books came out at Image, it was <laughs> yeah. Blue as Day Green yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was really weird. It was the zeitgeist of color. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we're wrapping that up. Issue 10 comes out uh, this upcoming Wednesday, yeah. and uh, we we have a few extra pages because it was it ended a bit early. Riley and I made the decision to uh, end it at 10 because it just wasn't selling well enough, yeah. truthfully. Um, so I, we got an extra, I think there's an extra six pages of art and story in, the, in this uh, issue. We wrap everything up, and for those people that have followed the series and feel like I still want to know more, on Wednesday on my blog, uh, Curtis Weeb at WordPress.com, uh, they can check out, I will be posting the entire mythology 
I've oh, got cool. everything cool. about Greenwick. So if you want to know, you don't want don't want to interpret it for yourself. You want everything fed to you. I'll do that for you. Oh, very cool. <laughs> and and um, working with Riley has been great. I mean, I, and you guys are gonna probably work together again in the future. Or? Yeah, yeah. Riley and I, we like we lived in the same town when we were doing Greenwick. He has moved away since, but it was a great op a great opportunity for us to work together, and it was an awesome awesome collaborative experience. So when we ended Greenwick, we were like, you know what, we want to work together again, and we want to do something a bit different, maybe a little bit lighthearted, outside of what we've done before. And so we came up with this concept, and it all, I mean, it's going to be announced here this weekend. It's called Debris, cool. and it's it's basically like a Red Sonja style story in a kind of post-apocalyptic Miyazaki uh, dystopian future, and it's about basically she's fighting giant transformers but I mean that's that's the the log line but it's it's a little bit more complicated than that but it's a lot of fun I'm, I'm really looking forward to it cool and that comes out this summer right yeah in July Excellent. Yeah. and then you've also got Grim Leaper coming out right what's that what's the premise of that one <laughs> Grim Leaper is a this is the quick the really quick sell yeah. it's a gory love story <laughs> uh, so the the concept is is it's about this guy named Luke Collins who has this really ridiculous curse that he dies in really disgustingly over-the-top uh, fashion, but then he wakes up in the body of a stranger, yeah. and this keeps happening to him. And we, we come into the story where he, it's been happening to him for a while. He has no idea why it's happening, yeah. but he's just kind of living life and dying and, and coming back and, you know, this new experience, and he meets a woman who has the exact same curse, yeah. and they start dating. Cool. So that's the premise. <laughs> nice. Is it a mini ongoing? Or yeah, it's, it's a four-issue mini, and we're actually doing something really awesome. I, I have a really great stable of friends that are really creative and really talented and what we're going to do in every issue we are going to have a five page backup story and it's going to be called more love stories to die for and they're all really twisted love stories cool. that we're going to have so you're going to get a lot of content you're going to get the full 22 pages of my story and then another five of you know a bunch of different creators that you know i'll announce that later on as they come out but really really awesome stuff cool. so you're super busy man you're, you're, you're just making comics right? i'm making a lot of comics I, I have the time now i quit my day job i'm doing this full time so right. it's it's going really well and yeah, it's exciting. I'm, I have a lot to do when I get back after this trip. So I'm here with Mark Silvestri. How you doing, sir? I'm doing great. Cool. Great. So here we are celebrating the 20 years of Image Comics. Uh, yeah. Did you ever think that it would get this crazy and this far? <laughs> you know, it's funny because, and this is an oft-told story that uh, six months after we were in business yeah. as Image, getting phone calls constantly from the guys at Marvel, the, the upper guys, like, you know, it's about time you guys came back. This isn't going to last much longer. And it's yeah. like. 20 years later, here we are. Yeah. You know, it's like, and now it's like we were talking, uh, the guys were talking last night and uh, kind of just trying to absorb the fact that Image Comics is now a part of pop culture history yep. because we have 20 years behind us and we can look back at a moment in time yep. that actually had an effect yeah. on something. Yeah. You know, um, and now that comic books has become such a big IP generator all over the place, the fact that we were a huge part of I think, I mean, you could fairly argue that that moment was the only real moment yeah. in comics history. Yeah. Everything else was pretty like, oh, here comes Marvel. It's like, oh, there's a couple characters that are kind of interesting. Marvel comes up, blah, 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 takes over DC, all that stuff. Yeah. But there was no bam yeah. ever in comics. Yeah. And you know, the closest you can come to is when Frank Miller threw out Dark Knight. <laughs> and everybody went, what? Or 86, <laughs> yeah, Watchmen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. You know, it's like, but... As far as impact and lasting impact, yeah. 1982 yeah. or 92. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. And it's also interesting when you think about where Marvel was at. I mean, it was like 25, 30 years from their inception yeah. to when you guys broke away. And now here we are. You're almost at the same point as a company. Like, that, that's something to be proud of. Right? It's a little crazy. <laughs> Eric Larson and I were talking about that last yeah. night. Yeah. And uh, the fact that, remember when you were a kid, bud, and you were reading comic books? And uh, think about how old you were. Yeah. And I was thinking, oh, okay, I was in the 70s. It's like, you know, Marvel was only 15 years old when you were reading comic books. Yeah. yeah. Going, oh, <laughs> man, thank you for making me feel even older. <laughs> but it's great. You know, yeah. we're here and we, we made changes that not only stuck, yeah. but they brought on a life of their own yeah you know so we're happy about that yeah and it's really interesting to see what you've done at top cow because in the 20 years you know like McFarlane's had spawn and there's been offshoots and you know and Lars has been new savage dragon but I feel as if top cow has been the one you guys have created new stuff all throughout these right. 20 years from cyber force to witchblade to darkness etc yeah. well I, I have OCD for one thing <laughs> no for real <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, it's 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 funny, but when the image opportunity happened, yeah. uh, I was kind of on my way out of comics, yeah. uh, simply because. And Rob's actually mentioned it, this about his career. Uh, there was this feeling because I was on the X Men. Yeah. Well, now what? 
You yeah. know, there was literally at that time nothing else beyond that. Yeah. You reached the pinnacle. Yeah. Okay, well, Mom, you can't be at the pinnacle for 30 years of your career. It's like, right, yeah. you know, you're already bored after a few. So um, I was actually on my way out until Image happened and went, all these possibilities, yeah. you know, all these ideas that you really had, you didn't know what to do with because you were at the mercy of. Uh, which look, I get the corporate structure of, I get it yeah. completely. You know, and more power to anybody who wants to work. You know, because yeah. being on your own is not for everyone. We understand that. Yeah. Uh, but suddenly, all the possibilities of all these ideas that before you would be told no to, yeah. nobody could tell you no. And you know, for me, it's like the floodgates opened up, and we literally couldn't publish enough ideas that we had. Yeah. You know, as a whole, and, and all the creative people that have been with us over the years, amazingly creative people, Joe Benitez, Mike Turner, all these guys with all these ideas, Dave Finch, and it's like, and myself, and it's like, uh, who could publish that many books? You know, and so that was like the great thing. You know, and, and part of the reason why, you know, Top Cow as a whole is kind of an expanded universe, which is unusual in this aspect of our genre, you know, that's not Marvel or DC. Um, and it's not because we want to be Marvel in DC. We don't you know, have any desire to be number one that big because it's yeah. pointless. <laughs> I don't understand it. Um, and we also don't want to di I dilute ourselves too much yeah. um, because you know less can be more. Obviously, we know that. And but once we uh, established that our universe was based in the supernatural, yeah. which is something DC and Marvel were not doing, obviously, um, it kind of took off from there. It's like you know what. We have these great ideas. We have great talent. Let's kind of start to expand a little bit slowly, based off of this stuff. So we have these, we have the technology-based universe of Cyberforce, and we have the supernatural uh, universe based off of Witchblade and Darkness. Yeah. And every now and then, especially surprises coming up in the future, those universes are going to start crossing. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, we're just having a great time. Yeah. No. That's what you know. That's the short answer. <laughs> you know why? Because it's fun. Okay. That's why we have so many ideas, because it's fun. Thank you. <laughs> That's most important. Well, congratulations. We're having fun reading. I mean, I'm loving Artifacts and, awesome. and the new direction everything's always ta taken currently right Thank now. You. Thank um, you. But it's just great to see you guys kind of still iterating. And, and like you mentioned, so many great talents coming out of you guys. And as an artist, I mean, was that something that was important to you in forming Top Cat or form like a studio, like a kind of a system to break new talent? Or? You know, it was because um, when I started in comics, literally, and that was with DC back in, nine, uh, in 1981, one. <laughs> oh. oh, my hernia. <laughs> um, I literally, uh, DC Comics um, sent me a script. Not a script, uh, a plot, more like Marvel style. And uh, that was a week after I got the gig, right? I got this thing in the mail. I was like, uh, now what do I do? <laughs> I mean, I literally had no idea. I didn't even know what size paper to work on. Right. Let alone, you know, who do I send it to? Yeah. You know, I, what do I do? Yeah, they <laughs> I was just like, dropped you right into it. Yeah. They did. They just yeah. threw me right into this thing yeah. with this eight-page, you know, yeah. uh, short story from I think uh, House of Mystery or something yeah. like that. And wow. I, I had not a clue. And it's like, wow, it took me years and years because we're all isolated. Yeah. You know, especially back then, you know, FedEx and all right, that yeah. stuff. It's like we were all over the country, and like very few people lived in New York that actually did comics. Yeah. Um, that I never wanted that feeling again personally, but I also thought, wow, if I had had someone at least who had been in the business to kind of mentor me a little bit, uh, I could have grown as an artist so much faster. And I could have gotten so much better so much faster just with the environment of being around people that do what I do. You know, I, I was never around anyone that even read comic books. You know, as I, let alone understood what the hell I was doing at a drawing board yeah. all by myself <laughs> at yeah. 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> you know, how do you explain that? You can't. Yeah. You know, so the idea of a studio, you know, especially when we were, were at Amish, uh Studios in San Diego with Jim and yeah. Wills and Scott, it was like, that was like comic book heaven, yeah. right? And right at the beginning of the Image, so things were crazy. But the atmosphere was amazing. Yeah. The energy, the second you stepped into that room, was just... You, I don't know if you could ever repeat it. You know, it's the closest thing that a non-drug addict can come to a drug. <laughs> yeah. Because you just feed off of each other. Yeah. And everyone gets good so fast. Yeah. Because everyone's looking at what everyone else is doing. I'm walking around and it's like, you know what, if we try this, this, or this. And I found that like mentoring and sort of teaching uh, 
was a lot of fun for me. Yeah. You know, I've been in comics for en enough years and I've seen enough that even if I'm lack in some area, I, I know someone who's really good. Yeah. You know, in, the, in that area. So I can point to that person and go, this is why this person rocks. Yeah, I, I use Mike Mignolo. <laughs> By the way, Mike. Um, because he's amazing at what he does and nobody else does what he does. So it's like if someone has, as an example, an issue with composition, you know, or with being, being bold with placing blacks in an illustration, I pull out the Mike Mignola reference, you know, and I say, yeah. look, this is how you do it. Yeah. You know, and this is how I tried to do it from him, and this is how I failed miserably. <laughs> but this is how you do it. Yeah. Right? And so the studio situation and the whole system, I think, was incredibly beneficial. And I think anyone who follows comics, you know, they, they see the people that came out of that system. And um, I don't think anyone who was involved in that could complain about being part of that. I think you, you ask anyone, they look kind of fondly back at those days where, you know, the doors never shut. It's 24 hours. You know, it's like it was great to walk into the studio at midnight, you know, and there was Mike Turner, there was Joe Benitez, there was Dave Finch, there was Billy Tan over there. You know, it's just, you know, Randy Queen was over there, and it'd be like just full house at midnight of guys doing what? Comics. You know, they were doing comics. You know, and Peter, Peter Steigerwall and Brian Haberlin were in the other room on, you know, the early days of using the Max for the yeah. coloring and production. It's like, I would look around and go, are you serious? This is the coolest thing ever. Yeah. You know, so it's like, ah. Living the dream. Yeah. It, it was <laughs> great. You know, and, this, and the, that camaraderie of comic books yeah. that um, is pretty hard to find elsewhere. Yeah. That's when true. you really think about it, you know, there's... Uh, all kinds of media, all kinds of genre for entertainment, but comics is very unique in that the brotherhood and sisterhood of comics, professionally and fan, are it's very tight. Yeah. It's very tight, and uh, it's unlike music and all that stuff. It's like you got these small groups of people that like each other yeah. and create stuff, but it's, it, the whole industry is not very yeah. close knit. You know, yeah. It's very cutthroat and. Like, yeah. Uh, good music comes out of it, but I, I, like, I like this business better. Yeah. You know? so I just do. You know? like, I mean, look around ImageCon. This is celebrating independence. This is yeah. celebrating. This is literally celebrating life because what life is to live it fully is to take some chances. Yeah. You know, so if I'm going to get you know metaphysical for a second, you know, it's like the whole spirit of independence is really the spirit of like living your life fully. <laughs> Yeah. You know, and pursuing your dreams. Yeah. You know, it's like you know, ask Robert Kirkman if any of his dreams have come true. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and and the biggest part of that dream, I think he'll tell you, is not just that he got a TV show on the air, yeah. which is awesome, yeah. but it's an extension of him, and he's and he's doing it. Yeah. You know, it's his. Yeah. All right. It's and he's having a good time. He can do what he wants with it. Yeah. You know, if he wants to, you know, get off the show, he can get off the show, and there's no more. But yeah. you know, it's up to him. Yeah. You know, and that's to me, that's. You know, doing it his way. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's like like Frank Sinatra would sing. You know, it's like, it's great. That should be the theme song of the Image Comics. Yeah, my you know? way. Right? Exactly. Well, you guys have definitely set an example for a lot of up and coming creators, and it's really exciting to see so many people here just loving comics. That's, that's great. That's yeah. awesome. And that's what this show's about. Yeah. This show's not about necessarily you know the next big blockbuster coming out. Watching trailers <laughs> in a dark room, right? Watching trailers <laughs> and stuff. You know, I mean, we got some Walking Dead stars yeah. here, but it's not. You know, we don't have. You know. Yeah. You know, not everyone's dressed as Iron Man here, yeah. so <laughs> it celebrates comics. Excellent. Yeah. I'm here with writer Jay Ferber. How you doing? I'm great, man. How are you? Good, good. So last time I saw you was last year in Seattle, yes. and you told me about a new book you had coming out in the fall called Near Death, and it's been out for about five, six months, yep. and I love it. Thank you, man. I, I, uh, is there a question in there? No, no, no it's, question. Uh, yeah. it's, it's, I'm, I'm glad to hear it. It's, yeah. it's, it's, I'm having so much fun with it. It's yeah. great. Let me. It's right here, actually. Oh, excellent. There you go. Near Death, first trade paperback. So how has the reception been? Have you been... It's good. Yeah. It's good, yeah. It's, it's a nice... We're really happy with it. Uh, you know, we could always use... There's always room for more readers, of course. Yeah. Uh, next issue comes out... Uh, I think the third week of March is issue six, and it's a great place to jump on. You and know. are you still like wicked ahead? Yeah, yeah. The uh, the artist Simone is drawing issue nine as we speak. Wow. That's great. And uh, yeah, it's awesome. So I got to write issue ten, and uh, we're keeping the same kind of 
largely done in one format. Issues six, seven, and eight are all single issues, uh, single issue stories, and then nine is going to kick off a multi-part story, probably two or three issues, just cool. a big climactic uh, story. Yeah. Which, one thing, one thing I wanted to ask you about was, you know, in recent years there've been a lot of crime comic books come out, and it seems like we've been so noir heavy. Yeah. And I wouldn't describe Near Death as yeah, noir. Yeah, no, I wouldn't either. I mean, people, yeah. people think that noir just means crime, and yeah. it's, there's not quite the same thing. This is more of a crime drama, a little bit of an action book, and it's 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 there may be stories that lean towards noir, but yeah. but it really is it's it's noir is kind of a, a the wrong tag for this kind of book. It yeah. is really just a, a crime slash action adventure book. Yeah. It's it's every week. Markham tries to atone for his sins by protecting some new person in danger, right. and it's just kind of a high concept, you know, a little bit of a character study too. We're 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 following his own internal struggle with, you know, can he atone for this? Yeah. Is it ever acceptable to kill someone, uh, you know, for the right reason? You know, yeah. can, can you kill to save a life? Is, how does that work? Yeah. All that stuff is fun to explore through this killer. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. So, and and now with Near Death, with Fatal, with mm -hmm. Thief of Thieves, there's like yeah. a little corner of crime happening at Image. It's nice. It's yeah. nice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be part of it. And I'd like to see that really foster. I mean, I think those are three books that, that do kind of play in some of the same areas, but yeah. they're all very distinct as well. Yeah, so yeah. It's, it's, it's nice to have that little, like you said, corner of the image uh, group there. Yeah, very cool. And so you're just wrapping up your uh, your run as a writer on the TV show Ringer, right? Yes, yes. We start shooting the season finale uh, this coming week, and so we're we're you know at the home stretch, and we're we're just kind of brainstorming ideas for season two now, and Ooh. have some crazy stuff cooked up for that. Uh, we haven't been renewed yet, but we're optimistic. Sure, yeah. And well, it's been, Sarah Michelle Geller. I mean, like, yeah, yeah, she's a, yeah, yeah. I, I would think so. And, and she's it's, the show's amazing. I mean, yeah. it's 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 weird to be talking. You know, with comics, there's such a a short lead time, yeah. but here we're talking about the season finale. But we're only in terms of air dates at about the halfway point of right. the show. So yeah. the stuff that we have done that you guys haven't seen yet is yeah. so cool. I can't wait for these episodes to roll out. Cool. It's really and fun. Has the writing experience kind of changed the way you approach writing comics, or it, it hasn't it, changed the, yeah. the, the way I approach writing comics? But I think it has made me a better writer. Yeah. I, I, I do definitely. You know, I'll be writing uh, an issue near death and think. You know, I'll hear in the back of my mind the other writers on Ringer, like, you know, oh, you know, you can you can make this better. You know, you you, you, you could do that idea you just had, but what if you did this? What if you know? Just it, it makes me push myself more, and and which is what writers should do. Every every story should be better than your last one, yeah. and 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 having that kind of group writing experience has really made me a better writer. I'm here with Ed Brubaker. How you doing, sir? Ah, tired. Yeah, it's been a long. <laughs> we're here at the Image Expo. It's been a long day, right? You got a, your yeah. line was ridiculously long. I know, it was insane. Yeah. Very cool. It was uh, much more than I expected. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, this is really the first time we've gotten to talk about Fatal since it came out. Congratulations. It looked like it did really well. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we cannot apparently print enough. Yeah. <laughs> we are now in a fourth printing yeah. of uh, issue one, a third printing of number two, and looking like issue three will be sold out by the time it gets released. So that's amazing. That's insane. Great. Yeah. Our numbers just keep going up every issue, yeah, which is unprecedented for me. That's great. So how does it feel to be part of the whole image experience now? You're one of the newer creators in image. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> one of the newer creators in image. I was I was actually not even involved in like, or I was working in independent comics when image launched, actually writing and drawing my own comics. So. <laughs> I always looked at Image very much like, hmm, what are those guys doing? Yeah. But uh, no, it's good. I mean, uh, Kirkman and, and Eric Stevenson really sort of you know came after me for a long time to do a book here. And yeah. so I decided to, to give them a shot with this one because it was a new project. And yeah. you know I figured at worst we'd do what we usually do. And you know they've, they've really gotten behind it and really pushed it. And you know been one of their best-selling books for very the last cool. couple months. So really good. So the, the premise, the kind of, it, it's very you know fans of Criminal and, and you're working, even Incognito, it's familiar because it's Sean Phillips and it's yeah. a little noir -y, but there's a little bit of Lovecraft kind of like you know, yeah like um, supernatural yeah kind of. exactly yeah. and that's that's probably as much influenced by like playing Lovecraft role-playing games as anything you know or, or like old hammer horror movies and yeah. I just I've been wanting to do something that tackled horror for a while and I just couldn't figure out a way to do it without trying to be like Neil Gaiman or right. Alan Moore or something and I needed to figure out a way to do it that right. still felt like me and I had had this idea for a project about immortal people for a long time, and I couldn't figure out how to make it work right. And the one aspect that kept coming back was the idea of this immortal incarnation of the femme fatale. And I, wanted, I had been wanting to do a story 
for God, a, like 10 years where the femme fatale was the main sympathetic character. Mm -hmm. And then I just suddenly like realized I could merge all those ideas and get my horror thing in in one thing. So it feels really epic to me. It's yeah. like, it feels like the biggest story I've ever done. Like I'm just about to start the second arc, which mostly takes place in the 70s in LA. Oh, wow. And it's like the sort of post Manson family LA. That's cool. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's it's a super fucked up time. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Well, the, the first arc takes place in uh, as someone who lives in San Francisco. It's like to see San Francisco yeah. represented. Is <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the interesting thing. Like in Criminal, we created our own little fake city, yeah. and have everything in it feels very real worldy. And then this one, it's like very, you know, I wanted to ground it as much in the real world as possible wall because it makes the horrible stuff and the monsters scarier when it seems like you're investigating a regular crime scene. It's like, oh no, there's like a guy who was sacrificed to a devil. Yeah. Like, you know, like how, how crazy would double indemnity be if the reason she needed to get rid of her husband was because he was going to like Rosemary's baby her. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that was my idea. It was like, what if there's all these other reasons for these noir stories? Yeah. And but yeah, so I thought I'll put it in real places this yeah. time, and and you know, and like like that first scene, uh, you know, with the car chase being chased by the plane on, you know, that's Highway One, yeah. you know, that's where the guy, you know, those guys from Pixar, like, you know, crashed, and and it's like. That was like to me. I was like every time I've been on that highway, I've been like terrified. Oh, me too. I drove so, it once. Yeah. Like, never again. <laughs> yeah, no. My wife is really good at driving those curvy roads, so I'm like, oh yeah, no, no, no. That's a, that's a good place for like a terrifying car chase. You know, when it's being chased by a plane, because that would be even worse. Because they don't even have to worry about the hairpin turns. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. That's too cool. So second arc's gonna go into L.A. And, yeah, second and... arc is L.A. and. Uh, not sure exactly where most of the third arc takes place yet, but yeah. I know it takes place in modern times. Very so cool. there's a lot of issue three opens in modern times. It's like the we, the story started in modern times and then flashed back to the 50s, and mm -hmm. we come back to that guy from the modern times throughout the first two arcs. But the third arc is is all about him and her, and cool. so it sort of ties up everything. Yeah. So and now you're working with Sean Phillips, so you've worked with Criminal and Incognito. Is yeah. this is Fatal and like you guys going to rotate through? We're going to get more Criminal at some point, or is it going to well, be just we're going to do Fatal? until it's done. We've got 15 issues figured planned out right now yeah. and it, it might get a little bit longer. I'm not sure. We'll see how this how it goes, yeah. but right like it was going to be 12 and then I realized I needed more room for each arc because yeah. there's so much story and so I just thought, "Oh, let's make it 15 and see how that goes to yeah. But um yeah, we're going to do that all the way through like one a month until it's done and then you know, and then we'll see what we'll hope the plan right now is to go back to criminal, but you know, I, you know, two, you know, six months ago, I wasn't going to do Fatal. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, well, it's funny because you never I, know. I still feel like Criminal is like new because it's yeah. like it's something new. So, because there's so a lot of the conversation here at the con has been about new ideas and comics and things yeah. like that. You've been in Criminal for years now. So. Yeah, we started in 2006. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, Sean and I have been working together for 12 years now. Yeah. We started, uh, he was our inker on Scene of the Crime, and yeah, then he right. and I did Gotham Noir together, and then Sleeper. and. Sean and my wife are the longest relationships. We I started I started working with Sean around the same time I started dating my wife. So <laughs> there's no jealousy yeah, there. No, <laughs> no, you know, no. But it is really it's like it's you know I, I realize now it's become a pretty long collaboration and you know I love working with the guy. I want to work with him for you know as long as I work in comics, which right. hopefully will be the rest of my life. So. Become one of those like legendary teams, like where people look back at the Brubaker well, Phillips years. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I was thinking about it. there aren't that many legendary teams that stayed together. Yeah. You know, it's like you look at those legendary teams and you know. The, Munoz and Sampaio are the only ones I can think of that actually continued to work together as like a writer artist team right, yeah. for you know 20, 30 years or yeah. whatever. So. Especially, especially as we get old. I mean, we grew up with the the runs like the yeah. Lee, Lee Kirby. Yeah, Lee and Kirby then, was 10, yeah. 10, 12 years of yeah. them working on a bunch of comics together and yeah. then nothing ever again. Yeah, exactly. You know, I wonder why. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe there's something to do with that. But. Yeah, so weird. Yeah. That Lee Ditko thing didn't last that long. <laughs> um, yeah, but no, I like those. I like those legendary runs, and I like that. I I found a collaborator that I can, you know, I've been lucky, like Michael Lark I've worked with a lot, yeah. and he and I are about to do some more stuff together, and Steve Efting and I are going to do some more stuff together, cool. and so I get these guys, and I get my hooks into them, and I don't want to let them go. Yeah, well, it's the, the Bendis school of uh, teaming, yeah. right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Brian's had those legendary runs, that's yeah. for sure. Yeah. So do you think you'll uh, come to Image with some um, additional creator-owned titles at some point, or...? Uh, we'll see. I mean, um, yeah, I uh, have a couple things on my plate that, you know, that I've got to, uh, you know, I still have commitments at Marvel and stuff, but I'd like to do more, you know, stuff that I own and, and they're certainly, you know, offering, you know, a really good deal. Yeah. So. Well, I mean, it's interesting, and, and as a creator, I mean, you've had a really interesting career from your own, you know, the, your yeah. early work to the corporate work and now with this kind of more independent work. 
a lot of creators are here at the con. This sort of thing has. You, do you have any advice for up and coming creators in terms of how to approach their careers? Or you know? boy, I don't know. You know, I always say make a plan. When I was in high school, I was going to make movies, and yeah. then I, but I always did comics because you know you could always afford paper, whereas yeah. Super Eight film was expensive to develop on a on a teenager's. And it took weeks to yeah. get back. I know right? it was ridiculous. It impossible. Yeah, <laughs> but um, you know, I you know I, I never planned to be a writer, and I certainly never planned to write Batman. I was always going to be like a guy who either wrote and directed films or, or wrote and drew my own comics and just sort of ended up writing comics for other people instead and then suddenly I ended up writing Batman and Catwoman and Captain and it's like these things were not things I necessarily planned yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they were just like opportunities that were there and I was like could I do that and you know a lot of it was like knowing Bendis who I'd known for you know 20 years and it's like seeing him doing Spider-Man I'm like I wonder if I could do Batman then mm -hmm. and you know it's just you know, sort of following the opportunities that develop. So, you know, the part of it is figuring out what you want to do, and part of it is following the opportunities that present themselves and being able to do it when they're there. Uh, you know, my thing was I always had one project or at least that I was working on that was just my thing. You know, like when it for it was, you know, Scene of the Crime and then Dead Enders and then Sleeper and Gotham Central, which, you know, which Gotham Central is a Batman book, but really it was just me and Greg writing a cop book. Right. You know, and, you know, as long as I've been at Marvel, I was only at Marvel for like a year before I launched a book through Icon. Right. You know, and it's like I, you know, I've always had that extra outlet that's just the thing I want to do only for, you know, creative impulses. So yeah. that's, you know, don't get lost in that world. You always have to have your own. It's something that shows what your voice is so you can develop your voice, I think. Yeah.